Jane can always come up with some very interesting facts on history. And she's with us this morning to talk about this bear that fought with the free Polish army in World War II. Jane, yes. what is this? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I discovered this book not too long ago uh, with, the, with the title, something like Wojtek, um, Soldier Bear or something like that. Uh, so I read it. And I was fascinated. You know, for one thing, it's, it's like a review of World War II history. And I think we, we forget sometimes a sequence, exact sequence, even when we were, though we were alive then. But uh, in, in, this, uh, in this story, I, it's kind of a recapitulation. I think, think about Poland and realize just what a contribution Polish, free Polish forces made to the military history of, of the war. Mm -hmm. And Poland, of course, had a long history going way, way back, uh, but very, very little of that time was spent as a, as a standalone country, Poland. Oh, there really? were Polish people all around. For a couple of hundred years, it was united with Lithuania, which used to be very powerful mm -hmm. in a commonwealth. But throughout that period, Poland went through some bad times, and amongst the worst, was of course in World War II. Mm -hmm. Because Polish came out, Poland came out of World War I as a standalone country again. Mm -hmm. And they fought a war with the Russians, 1919 and 20, right after that war ended. And they beat the Russians. And the General Pilsudski, I think, was a big name then. And they actually got kind of high on their horse because they, they, they'd beaten the Russians and they thought, well, we've got it made now from here on in. But such was not the case. Uh, things were going well for them economically and so on in the 30s and as you well know in fact even before that had some world famous people like Madame Curie, mm -hmm. Maria Skłodowska and of course musicians, Chopin, some of those so they were not beyond scientists but they other scientists um, they got to feeling I guess that they were strong enough to withstand just about anything but what they did unfortunately I think it was a clever thing to do was make a pact, a non-aggression pact with the Germans on one side, and this was in the 30s when the Nazis mm -hmm. were already there, the beginning, yeah. and with the Soviet Russians on the other side, because otherwise, you know, you could feel like being crushed in between and, and back to the old states, uh, which actually is what happened, because the, the Germans made a pact with them, and, uh, and then they made that pact with the Russians. Uh, and a few days after the Germans made the, the pact with Poland, they attacked Poland. Mm -hmm. And a week or so was all it took to ruin them. Right. A couple of weeks later, the Russians attacked from the other side, and then they just divided Poland. They yeah. went right back to the 1790s and split Poland up amongst everybody. So there were a lot of Poles everywhere, but there was no Poland mm -hmm. anymore. Uh, now, and when World War I, uh, really began when, when the Nazis attacked Soviet Russia, which everybody gasped, the whole world sort of gasped when that happened. But they attacked Soviet Russia, and the Russians, of course, were fighting them back. But meanwhile, the Russians became one of our allies. Yes. The British, the French, the United States, mm -hmm. and, some, and some, lesser, <laughs> some lesser powers, and the Russians. Well, the Russians, some months later, uh, and meanwhile, of course, they had, had arrested and jailed and exiled to Siberia a whole bunch of, of people in Poland that they didn't like. Mm -hmm. uh, so they started releasing them. They released some from jail, and then some months later, they released some from the Siberian, all of them, I guess, in fact, from the Siberian labor camps. And if we could please see the map, the first nice brightly colored map we have here. Uh, this map shows you in red where the... Soviet Russians dominated. The Germans are that dark gray covering Central Europe and extending a little bit. The yellow ones are the supposed neutrals, um, or the, the sort of beige ones. The bright yellow is the Japanese Empire there at the time. So here you had these people in Siberian labor camps, and you, you, you can see that now that if they were released, where did they go? Well, there was really only one direction to go, and that was south. And they went down, went down, and they came out. Uh, you, you can see kind of where India sticks down. You see Africa there. And then above India, you can see the Caspian Sea to the right there, the blue blob, and the 
Black Sea to the left, and the Caucasus in between, and that's where they came down. So they came down through there into Iran, or Persia, I think it was still called then. And here were these people that had suffered considerably. There were a lot of women soldiers amongst them, too, because there had been women in the army. So here they were living this difficult existence and coming out of the labor camps to be freed, you know, for this almost tougher existence. And one day, a little kid showed up with a bag over his shoulder, and the bag seemed to be moving. And these, these people, these, these Poles, said, well, what sort of, let's see, you know, of course they couldn't communicate anyway with, with them. And inside was this tiny bear cub. And they decided that they would like to have this, you know, something, a, a, a pet to glom onto or something, a, a little ray of warmth, you know, in this difficult existence. So they bartered with the boy. They realized that he was probably, he found it. The mother had probably been killed. Mm -hmm. And he would found it, and he was going to sell it to some of those people that put rings in bears' noses, mm -hmm. you know, and try to scrape a living that way. So they bartered with, with, with the child, and he, he was saying no. When the last thing, they had a big tin of bully beef, you know, that the British, I guess they were, had British supplies at the time. Uh, but they, uh, anyway, the boy agreed. So here they had this tiny, tiny bear. Uh, and I don't have a good picture there. There's a, I've seen a picture of him sitting on, they had a bucket upended, and this little thing is sitting on top of it. And of course, he was to grow to seven feet tall or whatever. <laughs> when we really got going. But that, that was how it all began. Uh, now, in, in the meantime, the, this, it, the unit was the uh, 22nd, uh, it became the, the 22nd, it was a support unit, artillery support which means they had to carry and truck and in any way get uh, these supplies to the front line, to the soldiers. Well, they, they were assigned to go to Palestine, which the British were hanging on to then. See how this little bear leads you to all kinds of historical <laughs> background facts. The British were hanging on to it, and of course that area is a, a tender K now. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a terrible, terrible, terrible place, Syria and, and on down. Um, but they, uh, they spent a couple of years in this tropical thing, and the bear grew up. And we will presently look at a couple of pictures. Uh, not right now, because I want to show them, t tell this outline story first. But the, the bear uh, was growing up all the time, and we've got some cute pictures. It was, they wrestled with the bear. turned out to be a he. Uh, they, they wrestled with, with the little creature. They named him Wojtek. And that's where this name comes from. In Polish, it's something like uh, Wojciech. It's pronounced, I think, really like that. But in English, he's customarily referred to as Wojtek. And we have, in fact, someone who takes care of our exercise room on Saturday mornings. The normal staff is not yes. there. His name is Wojtek. Yes, it a is. Lo a lot of you, I'll bet, know him. Yes, yeah. and he is big, too. <laughs> he is big, and he's very pleasant and nice. Yes, he is. But he's, uh, he knows all about Wojtek. So I, I have this book on Wojtek, and I gave him a copy of it, and he was really tickled with it because mm -hmm. he'd never seen it in writing. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, the story goes on in a quite interesting fashion. Uh, if we look at the map again, please, uh, we can see that they came down, this, this uh, company or group or whatever, they came down, and the, the place where all that yellow that looks like foam there and then India below it, those are the so-called neutral areas. And then below there... You, you got into a part of the British protect, protectorate area. So there they are on the eastern edge of the Mediterranean. They're on the edge of the desert, the Negev Desert. So nobody was having any, any winter weather problems. The little bear had been born in the mountains, you know, in the Syrian mountains, a little cub. And they got orders to go to Italy because things were heating up there in North Africa. A lot of Polish forces participated in the North African campaign. Oh. Uh, Wojtek's unit did not. But uh, well, they got up to Italy, and in the meantime, Wojtek uh, had reached pretty much his full height. He more, spent more than a year in the Palestine area. But here's this great, huge thing. They wrestled with him. Uh, he had certain things he liked especially. He got into trouble a lot because he was curious. But the animal really thought he was a person. I, I would imagine. Uh, he grew up that way. Mm -hmm. Only once is recounted in this book that he was uh, faced with another bear. Another unit actually had a bear, which they had to get rid of. But this other bear was not friendly. It obviously had not been raised as a, as a person, yeah. <laughs> more or less. Uh, but when they were faced, the so Wojtek immediately dropped on all fours, mm -hmm. and growling began on both sides, and they began to wrestle. And it was hard to get them apart. They finally did. 
but they, and, and Boychek liked, uh, I had a great pal who was a dog, a Dalmatian dog, so you know, he didn't dislike <laughs> other animals. He got along with them pre pretty well. But in Italy, they fought their way up the coast, and then came the campaign for Monte Cassino. And some of us probably, I remember the name, but I don't remember really you know, what was going on. But that was a pretty name. But Monte Cassino was uh, a town, and there was a huge monastery up there, so it was religious grounds. But the Germans had fortified it very carefully. They had their Gustav line and went across Italy, and no, nobody was supposed to get past that. Well, mm -hmm. Wojtek's unit got up there to the, well, approx approximately the level of the Gustav line, and then they were ordered to participate in this campaign. And Anzio was on the other side. That most people have heard of the Anzio, yeah, Anzio. And the terrible mm -hmm. fight in the Anzio mm -hmm. to get a beachhead, and they had a terrible time hanging on to the beachhead because the Germans did have this a fortified area. But they uh, they finally did get close enough to it to really start besieging it, and it took them. I think they started in January, and it was May when they finally took it. Mm -hmm. But the poles were assigned. The, to spearhead this fourth attack. They were at the head of it all. So, of course, they had lots of artillery and they had vehicles, and these Polish soldiers were driving trucks up hairpin curve mountain roads, dirt roads, with no light. It said some of them had to lie on the hood and look and say, turn left here, or here's the hairpin, <laughs> with the, the ammunition. And they had uh, some pictures you see show, <clears throat> show them carrying the shells separately, but mostly I think they had 25, the uh, number 25s and they were in a box. So the soldiers would carry them, extend their arms, and, and the box would be placed on it, and they just had a moving band going from the, from the back of the front mm -hmm. to the front and, and where the guns were. Well, without any coaching of any kind, Wojtek watched, and he did what they did anyway, you know. He played, and he wrestled, and he did these things. Wojtek went over and put his arms out. <laughs> You know, to, to where they were dishing him out. And they laid one on his arms, and he just followed the line of soldiers over to the, the gun carriage and laid it down <laughs> carefully the way they were doing and went on back. And the only difference between Wojtek and the other little, little Polish GIs was that if he felt like stopping, he could stop, He'd rest for a minute, uh -huh. put it up. But he worked hard in that whole campaign, which I think is a sort of charming story. <laughs> he, he was one, one of them. But the war, um, of course, eventually ended. They, they, were, they were still in Italy, uh, and they were they'd been withdrawn somewhat to the west. They had others were, were holding the territory there. So they, uh, when, when the war ended, what was supposed to happen to them? Well, there was no homeland to go home to because their only homeland was what the Soviets had set up. Mm -hmm. And they were so smart, they, they set a puppet government up right away. But that was not done in, in other parts, so uh, parts of the uh, uh, Europe and, well, Europe, you know, the only kind of one place involved there. But they did, uh, they were ordered to go back home to England. See, they, originally they, they had aimed for France, and then of course France fell. Syria and those things had been French colonies, and I think they had a little more affinity. But when that happened, they, uh, England became their, mm -hmm. their home, mm -hmm. and they, uh, they set up their government, their uh, in exile government, so to speak. And it was in England, n not underground. There was a strong Polish underground, but that didn't affect them. So here, here they were, and they were taken back to Scotland. And in fact, the author of this book I read is a Scottish woman who experienced the arrival oh. of these people with Wojtek. Mm -hmm. Wojtek apparently was a good traveler, but uh, uh, with Wojtek, and he got into trouble now and then. But people, uh, the, the people, they, it was all right with them. Some of the Poles, uh, the British, as I've read, were not too nice about it because they urged these Polish soldiers and officers to go back to Poland, repatriate, go back to your homeland. And some of them did. And of course, the minute they got back there, they were either executed as traitors mm. or you know, just put in prison or just treated very badly, mm -hmm. and their families too. So a lot stayed on, and Wojtek uh, stayed with them. Eventually, he wound up in a zoo. Uh, they did have to restrain him sometimes, sometimes when they were billeted with other units, for instance, overseas. Mm -hmm. He was so curious, he'd walk around. 
and people would be in a panic if they'd wake up at night and this bear was in their bed because he liked he liked to cuddle. <laughs> when it was that size. Well, sure. I always cuddle. done that. <laughs> but I would like now to, to look at a series of pictures of Wojtek and some other little anecdotes will come out. There are a lot of anecdotes in that book, and some of them are very funny, but destructive. <laughs> they could be destructive. So please, yeah, here now, here is a, it looks like a gravestone sort of, but what it is, if you look at the thing in the center, um, that is a bear who's facing to the left, and over his shoulder he has a shell. Mm -hmm. And then there's two paws, his two arms are under it. Uh, the next one shows you a, a nice shot, a nice, um, this was a patch that all the people in Wojtek's unit got to wear, and I think they kept wearing them. Even these people stayed in a military setting, really, mm -hmm. in Scotland. Uh, but you, you can see the uh, uh, importance of, of, of uh, Wojtek as a morale factor. Yeah, and this next one now, this allegedly was for uh, Monte Cassino, and there's another very pretty one for that that I could not find a picture of, and, and couldn't couldn't take one. But here again, he's, he's uh, and it, they're not really like the bear because this bear, this artificial bear, is, look, looks much more the way Wojtek really looked. The very short legs, you can see here, the little short legs and then the kind of, kind of leaning back posture there to him and, and the, the sloping shoulders, the low shoulders, pointed nose. Uh, this was more like what Wojtek really looked like. It's comfortable, a huge teddy bear kind of thing sometimes. Mm -hmm. And as we go on and look at some more pictures now, we'll seeing, seeing the one of him carrying this reminds me of a time when I was in Winchester. I lived west of Winchester in the mountains. And a friend of mine was bringing groceries in, and she went, she went back for a second load to her car. And what she saw <laughs> was a bear with groceries in his arms walking up the driveway. Really? <laughs> yes. Oh, how great. I thought you were going to say they would disappear to the bear. No, the bear was just oh, carrying them away. <laughs> That's tremendous. <laughs> well, one, one of the anecdotes they tell about him while he was still in Italy, just before the end of the war, some other unit was nearby, and they were walking through uh, the terrain. There were some woods and open, some open land. And they saw a bear come out of the woods and head for this unit that they were also heading for, and they thought, good Lord, and they hollered out, there's a bear, you know, bear, watch it, watch it, and no response, you know, it was just sort of ho-hum, <laughs> and then they realized, like, and the bear then went back into the woods and came out again, it was carrying, you know, carrying something, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so they, uh, but that, that's wonderful, I mean, that's real, that's real life. It does really happen. <laughs> it does really happen, great. Well, they, they now, as I look again, pictures. Here's the bear, sort of a, a sort of teenage here, looking very much like a large teddy bear. Uh -huh. And some of the little little soldiers around. And of course, they were always hungry. Uh, and here they were, I think they were playing beg, you know, either way you play beg with, with a dog particularly. Uh, and here's another one where they're playing, playing beg with him. And here he's a lot bigger. And this restraint they had, he was not kept in jail. In Scotland later, they had to keep him restrained most of the time. But uh, otherwise, he was perfectly free to roam around. And he ran away. Oh, and if we go, go back to that, well, that's all right. I have another one that shows it. And now here he is wrestling. See, he's a little bigger now. Mm -hmm. But he's still uh, no six, seven feet tall. But again, this sort of woolly, and I, I don't know why his feet are darker, but this might have been you know, baby coloring just going away as he got older. And his little face is heading out. And this one gives new meaning to the term bareback riding. <laughs> we think of ladies in spangles, you know, and toe shoes and how, uh, well, anyhow, here is uh, one, one of the little Polish GIs sitting on, and look look how happy Wojtek, or Wojtek looks. Yeah. And those lovely teeth in there. But there he was, and you can see his little claws. And here's, here's a smile for the, mm -hmm. for the photographer. Old bear. But the teddy bears were made very much. Now, here's one that I want to show particularly. I don't know if he, if he had some kind of a condition or whatever. His nose looks very funny here. But look at the hands and the uh -huh. claws uh -huh. and look at the pads on the feet. So you can see what equipment he had, yet he never, never hurt or mauled yeah. anybody, which is pretty remarkable. Uh, 
they didn't do it, so I guess he didn't do it. Now, what kind of bear was he? He was a black bear, a black what's bear. called a black bear. And you can see the short legs, but then as, as he grew more, and as he stood up, of course, and we have another one, yes, this one, uh -huh. over there, the, the, I suppose they were playing big with him there in a way, but giving him a treat up there, but uh, you can see how tall he was. Uh -huh. the, these Polish soldiers, some of them were very tall, but most of them were small and uh, undernourished, uh -huh. smaller or uh -huh. average size. But look at that his fur coat and everything. You can see how short the legs were. Right. And he usually didn't uh, go on all four. He usually uh, stood up and walked, walked around. Well, so his the way they his did. companions did. So his why companions not? did. So why not? <laughs> but now here, when one of the times they took ship, uh, they they when they took ship from Palestine to go to Italy, they went to Egypt first to Alexandria. And. Well, some of them sailed from Port Said, but he's a unit, which was the 22nd, what, support, whatever it was, company. Uh, and you can see him here. It's not the clearest of all pictures, but this, it was in Alexandria. And they had a, one of those uh, roller things, I guess, to load cargo. See, the one he, mm -hmm. in the foreground is the one he's on. You can see his, his head is sort of lighter color. He's hitting right. Behind it, there's a, a, a person gang, a people gang plank. Uh, where they were also going to be getting on. And here is a shot. If I had to title this, I'd say one of the boys because <laughs> he really, really felt like one of the boys. But this was a gotten up shot, but uh, and, and it showed he was, for all of his occasional, like a bad child, you know. Yes. And, and he would know oftentimes that he had done something that he shouldn't have done. He would raise his paws and put them over his oh. <laughs> Can you imagine? And his... Uh, his main person, his, his mentor, was a soldier named Peter, and I've forgotten Peter's last name, but at any rate, Peter was one of the older, well, the older guy there, the rest were quite young, teens and 20s, but he in his 40s, I think, and he was really, really buddies with Wojtek, and Wojtek would listen to him. The time they, uh, the other bear, the unit with the other bear, mm -hmm. was next to them, and he saw it. Uh, that's the only way they got them apart. Peter came up and spoke to him, and so apparently the voice meant something. Mm -hmm. He could distinguish that. Uh, but yes, so the uh, uh, the others had a certain amount of influence on him, but they have stories about, uh, oh, about water. You can imagine when they were in Palestine, water was a premium. Mm -hmm. But this poor bear, if the temperature would be 117 oh, in the yeah. shade, you know, it, it was not, not so well off. But they would, he would sit near the, a water faucet, an outdoor faucet, and get anybody going by, you know, sort of big. And he could kind of whimper, you know, apparently. <laughs> he, he could look really, well, all seven of them could look really pitiful. <laughs> and they'd be, like a dog, you know, yeah. would look at you. But then he'd get in there, he, he'd, they'd, hey, they'd lock the door to the shower. But he did a very great service to that unit because they, they did have to lock the shower because he was using just too much water. He'd go in there all the time. They locked the door, and he'd hang around hoping somebody would forget to lock it <laughs> when they were inside or outside. And one night, he discovered the door open, unlocked, and he went in. And pretty soon, these horrible shrieks were coming from inside. And it turned out it was an Arab spy. And the guy was petrified. He said, I'll tell you everything. <laughs> <laughs> he was scared silly. Yeah, so you see, he got, and it turned out it was a whole... He had a network there, and this guy was so scared. Of course, all they had to do was threaten him to bring the bear back. Sure. And he'd, he'd talk again, <laughs> and he revealed who the contacts were getting on, so they rolled up a whole little net of spies. He, he had been on his way to assess the, how much ammunition they had <laughs> stored, and he went <laughs> to take a shower. I don't know how he got in, right. the spy. He must have climbed in some way that, yeah. that boy, they couldn't. But anyway, when he came out, then, of course, he opened the door, and... Uh, and they got him, but uh, yeah. So he performed some not not only carrying ammunition, but other little tasks. He would carry other things for people as mm -hmm. well. He just liked to be helpful. Mm -hmm. But in in Scotland, of course, his wings were clipped to some extent. They had to keep him restrained a good deal of the time. But people people did did like him a lot, and he did. He became a sort of local legend. Uh, in fact, I think they had some pet name for him. But he loved to fish, and of course those those white mountain streams in Scotland, oh, yeah. you know, Highland Scotland, 
loaded with fish. Well, he would get in there and he'd just, you know, have a ball. He'd get in there and fish. And he used to like some of the ladies. Uh, they, they, never, uh, they never ran across a female bear. They don't know what might have happened then. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of these women in the units, women soldiers. And the women used to go swimming at a certain spot. And he would uh, get underwater there. Must have been deep enough. He, he got underwater and would swim up and surface in the middle of the little bunch <laughs> of women who were around there swimming and potching and whatnot. And of course, the first time he did it, they were, <laughs> even though they, they knew who it was, they were scared out of their wits. Sure. But he loved to do that. <laughs> and they loved to have him. Mm -hmm. But he, he was uh, described as uh, private Wojtek. Private Wojtek. And that began in Palestine because they had to draw rations for him. Oh. Uh -huh. They said that he would eat the equivalent, I don't know, based on weight or something, but the equivalent of several hundred apples a day had to be fed to that bear, and they couldn't scrimp out of their own things to the, that extent. Uh -huh. So, they, in fact, it was hard enough, you know, as it was, but the uh, catching fish was a good idea because that mm -hmm. fed him. But he uh, I, became private Wojtek, and when they went uh, on board ship, they had to think of some way of... Uh, authorizing him to, to do that. So uh, somewhere along the line, they promoted him to Corporal, <laughs> Corporal Wojtek. But they had no problem, and they needed some uh, authorization in Scotland for something or other. Uh, and it was granted. It was unusual, but it was, uh, they put in for it, and they didn't try to cheat, you know, sneak past on anything. <laughs> but he appeared in, I think when, when they first arrived in Scotland, they had a course of parade in, in uh, in Glasgow, they went to Glasgow, not Edinburgh, uh, and he marched with the parade. <laughs> and I guess people just enchanted him, here's this bear. But eventually, the unit had to be either completely assimilated or leave or move on, you know, or do something else. It could not exist any longer as that unit. So those who didn't make the mistake of going back to Poland just became assimilated elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And there was no other recourse than putting boy take in the zoo where he would at least be cared for and he could not harm anybody mm -hmm. and they would visit him at the zoo and he'd you know come pattering right over and, and <laughs> but he was sad they said they could, they could yeah, tell he was right. kind, of, kind of sad well, we're down to the last minute well you know i think as, as a closing i thought about this in advance what, what a good closing remark to this would be and i was thinking um true this is to a large extent an animal story but the way we take representative human beings, and their biographies count as history. We write their biographies, we study them. I mean, Eddie Rickenbacker, for instance, is a history of World War II from another angle, mm -hmm. an important one. But why, why, not, why not an unusual, outstanding animal, noteworthy animal who d did unusual things, and who also performed the service of sort of knitting this unit together. Now, if other animals, uh, outstanding amongst the others are carrier pigeons. Yes. Carrier pigeons are really remarkable creatures. Right. right. And they, they get to know their handler. They're not as cuddly as a, as a no. bear. <laughs> the carrier pigeons, and in World War I, a couple of the units had animals. One had the famous whiskey and soda, the two lion cubs. Mm. But they never did anything. You know, they, they, they just uh, uh, they just rode on the whole thing free, see. But <laughs> Boitek tried to earn, Boitek earned his way. Earn his keep. <laughs> so he, uh, he died there eventually in, in the zoo, and he's buried as a, a monument to him. That was wonderful. Yeah, yeah. so it's a... Well, that's a wonderful story. Wonderful story. Now, now you know all about the bear that fought with the Free Polish Army. Free Polish Army.